Starting in the late Middle Ages in Germany, there was a tradition among the guilds where if you were going to learn a trade like mason or baker or painter or anything like that, you first of all had to apprentice yourself to a master. And after your years of apprenticeship, you would receive a seal of apprenticeship, a letter, and you would be spoken free as the expression said, just as when at the end of Wilhelm Meister's Lehrjahre, or at least at the end of Book 7 of The Apprenticeship, he's given his freedom. In fact, the last words of Book 7 are spoken by the Abbe, and he says, your apprenticeship is completed, nature has given you your freedom. So, the question arises, what has he been trained for? What is his trade? Is it the trade of living life? Is it the trade of building, of developing himself just as he was meant to be? And how do we continue that tradition? What is the equivalent of the years of wandering, the journeyman years? Because what would then happen with the apprentice in the guilds after they had completed their apprenticeship? They would be sent on journeys of Wanderung, Wanderjahre. And the specific intention there was that they would travel and that they would learn from various other masters in other places. And then when they would return home, they would have gained foreign knowledge and they would be able to exchange that with the domestic knowledge. So they would then become masters themselves. Here again, we have to ask, what is Wilhelm's journey going to be? What is he going to be training himself in? My name is John Noyes and I'm here to guide you through the reading of all of Goethe's novels. We now turn our attention to the journeyman years of William Master. Wilhelm Meister's apprenticeship set itself the task of telling the story of a life unfolding, a life developing, and developing such that natural drives could be allowed to unfold, but also so that they could do so within social constraints. So you had this tension between the natural impulses and social form or social rules, regulations, morals, laws. And this meant that some sacrifices were going to have to be made. The word here is entsagung, renunciation. Wilhelm was going to have to learn to renounce certain of his impulses. And how was this going to happen? Well, this is what happens when we move from the apprenticeship to the journeyman years. We start learning about what the meaning of renunciation is. So what is at stake in the journeyman years is what needs to be sacrificed, what needs to be renounced, what needs to be given up in terms of natural drives and natural impulses if social relationships are going to be possible. Social relationships, we saw what that looked like in the apprenticeship. It was about love relationships, it was about class relationships, it was about the different kinds of professions. It was about developing your artistic impulses, but also being able to make a living as a middle-class citizen. It was about all of these things. Now, as the book moves towards a close, we start to see that it becomes centered around the relationship between Wilhelm and his son, Felix, and around taking responsibility for his son. And this is in fact the moment when nature speaks him free, as the Abbe says, nature grants him his freedom. That is the moment when he is learning to take responsibility for his son Felix. Now when we move on to the journeyman years, this is the theme that's going to be unfolding. So let's look for a moment at some of the moves that Goethe makes from the apprenticeship to the beginning of the journeyman years. When it comes to love, the apprenticeship ends a happy ending. It would seem it ends with a marriage. A happy ending. Wilhelm has found happiness, even though he didn't necessarily deserve it. But it also ends with a question around a child's education. 
So we have the familial triangle, mother, father, and child. And this is going to provide the beginning, the opening scene of the journeyman years. We have an archetypal family, the holy family, the flight from Egypt. And the journeyman years can be read as a series of experiments in family relationships. I'll be saying more about that at a later stage. And part of a family's responsibility is taking care of the next generation, which means education. And so the theme of Bildung, which was this all-encompassing expression, which included not only education in the formal sense, but also self-development. This concept of Bildung is going to shift somewhat towards the theme of education, Felix's education. The very last time that we see Felix in the apprenticeship is when he has just saved himself by his bad manners, by his lack of education, if you will. He's drunk from the bottle instead of from the glass, like his father always told him to do. And so the last words that he speaks in the apprenticeship, we read him saying to Natalie, you are so kind, you never get angry, you never beat me. So I will tell you, I did drink out of the bottle. My mother Aurelia always slapped my fingers when I reached for the carafe. My father looked so fierce, I thought he was going to hit me. But Felix has saved himself from poison by drinking from the bottle instead of from the glass. Now when we meet him again in the journeyman years, then he is eager to learn. He's bursting for an education. And this is what will happen to him. He's going to be sent to the so-called pedagogical province, where he will get some kind of an education. And again, we'll have more to say about what this strange education might actually be. But it's not only Felix who's going to get an education in the journeyman years, it's also Wilhelm. Wilhelm, whose apprenticeship is surrounded by this strange mystery about what exactly he has become and what he's going to become, he now finds a calling, he finds a vocation, and he's going to become a surgeon. So where the apprenticeship ends with Felix saving his own life, or fate saving his life, if you like, through Felix's bad manners, the journeyman years are going to end with Wilhelm saving Felix through his professional training as a surgeon. But this isn't only the story of Wilhelm's training and Felix's education. It's also the story of what will happen to this society of the tower, this mysterious society which is kind of pulling the strings behind Wilhelm's development in the apprenticeship. Now they have plans to spread out, to emigrate, to colonize, if you like, and they have plans to incorporate Wilhelm in all of this. But we already learned at the end of the apprenticeship that this society is somehow in a certain way falling apart, or as Jarno says, they've kind of gotten slightly ridiculous. The people who were involved in the tower, they now smile about their erstwhile project. The developments from the apprenticeship to the journeyman years don't only have to do with the content, they also have to do with the way the story gets told. We saw already the use of irony as a central narrative device in the apprenticeship, and I think we also saw why irony was necessary. Because in order to tell the story of a life unfolding, you have to assume some outside knowledge of where that life is supposed to go. But how can you assume that? How can any one human being know the meaning of life? That is reserved for divine knowledge, surely. And so you have this narrator speaking as though he does know everything, but meanwhile wanting to signal to the reader that there is some sort of a problem around knowledge itself. Now this is going to be carried forward into the journeyman years. We find this same ironic narrator, but the irony is more pointed in a way. And I think a really good example of that is 
if we look at pages 176, 177 of volume 10 of the collected works. Wilhelm has just arrived at Macaria's castle, and she and an old man are about to have a conversation, a learned conversation, and the old man kind of hints that maybe Wilhelm shouldn't really take part in this conversation. Maybe he's not up to it, maybe he'll get bored. And um, he says to him, uh, the old man says to Wilhelm rather tactfully, um, yet we ought first to ask whether our new friend even wishes to delve into a fairly abstruse matter, or whether he would not prefer to retire to his room for some needed rest. In other words, um, we don't really need you at this conversation, why don't you go and sleep? And then after they agree that Wilhelm can stay and take part in the conversation, um, we read that the old man is about to start reading, and then the narrator interrupts and says, If, however, we find ourselves disinclined to let the worthy man read, our patrons will most likely be pleased, since what was said earlier against Wilhelm's presence at the conversation applies even more to the situation in which we find ourselves. We know this, we of the narrator, basically saying, well, if Wilhelm shouldn't have taken part in that conversation, then maybe you, dear reader, and I, dear narrator, should also not take part in the conversation. And in fact, the narrator doesn't tell us what was spoken of. Instead, he tells us that later on he'll give us some information about it. We know this narrator. This is the ironic narrator of the apprenticeship. But the narrator of the journeyman years is going to do something more subtle and something more confounding. This narrator is going to build the problem of knowledge and reading, of acquiring knowledge, into the very structure of the book. The book is built around a central enigma of finding a casket and waiting for the key and finding out what will be in the casket when the key unlocks. In Book 1, Chapter 12, Wilhelm is on his way to St. Felix to the pedagogical province and he enters into conversation with an old man about the casket. And they're debating whether they should open it by force. And the old man says, to be sure, I suppose it could be done without undue harm. However, since you came by it through such a curious chance, you ought to try your luck on it. If you were born fortunate, and if this casket has any significance, then the key to it must turn up sometime, and precisely where you least expect it. Now it's been suggested that this image of a found casket, which contains an enigma, and a missing key, and waiting to find out what's there, is all an analogy for reading. So the process of reading, of reading this very novel, Wilhelm Meister's Journeyman Years, is analogous to finding a casket, recognizing that there might be an enigma connected to it, and not having the key, but waiting for the key to more or less drop into your hands for fate to drop the key into your hands, if you like. And we will see that towards the end of this book, this entire reading process is almost satirized, but certainly problematized by Goethe. What is it you're going to find in the casket? What is the enigma of this book? How are you going to get it? And will you in fact ever succeed in getting it? So what is happening here is the reader is being challenged to confront their own hermeneutic work, their own interpretational work in reading this very book. And it's going to be happening on several levels. The one is resolving enigma, working out what the puzzle of the book is and working out whether it's been resolved or not. The other is going to be dissecting action, if I can put it like that, observing the actions of the characters in the book and trying to analyze them in order to obtain meaning for them, in order to obtain meaning from them, this surgical work, if you want, this work of dissection. And then there's also going to be the work, 
the synthetic work, if you want, of assembling various diverse narratives in order to try and construct some kind of meaning out of them. So the reader's work of constructing meaning is being dramatized in the very structure of this book. Almost immediately after the apprenticeship appeared, Goethe writes to Schiller and he tells him on the 12th of July 1796 about the plans he has for the continuation of the novel. And this shouldn't surprise us because it's built into the structure and it's built into the plot of the apprenticeship that somehow Wilhelm's development is not complete. Even when he finds his happy ending, something at the back of our minds must be telling us that this is not the end. A happy ending cannot be the end because Bildung, self-development, is an ongoing process. And this is going to be a problem for Goethe at the ending of the journeyman years as well. How do you stop telling the story of a life when a life is not complete until the person dies? It wasn't really until quite a bit later though that Goethe was serious about writing the novel. He started collecting material for it in 1807 and he started writing some of the novellas that he incorporates into it in 1808. And we saw that the Wahlverwandtschaften, Elective Affinities, was in fact intended to be one of these novellas until it expanded beyond the framework of simply being a short prose text. Throughout the first half of 1808, Goethe is working on the journeyman years. He's also working on one of his most important scientific studies, and that is the theory of color. This investigation where he puts forward the idea that color cannot possibly be a purely objective phenomenon, it has to have a subjective dimension as well. And this shouldn't surprise us. We know Goethe by now well enough to realize that for him, nature and nature's force is objective. It has objective validity, but it's not purely objective. It is also subjective in all of its aspects. In the years that follow after 1808, Goethe is working on various literary projects. For example, he works on and completes the West East Divan, that collection of poetry inspired by the Persian. And he also revisits a number of his scientific studies. For example, he's interested in morphology, he's interested in the methodology of the natural sciences in general, and he's also still interested in this concept of Bildung, this concept of self-formation and self-development. Um, and he's also interested in um, what he calls recent philosophy, a German idealist philosophy, the philosophy of Kant, Fichte, Schelling, and others. September 1820, he returns to the journeyman years and he starts working quite intensely on it, continuing right up until 1821 when it's published. Um, and at the same time, he's reading a translation of Lucretius, Lucretius um, De Rerum Natura, this fascinating text um, that argues for a structure of the universe built upon atoms. And I can recommend to you um, not only Lucretius's book, but also Stephen Greenblatt's magnificent study of the rediscovery of Lucretius in the Renaissance and also his exposition of Lucretius's ideas. In May 1821, Cotta publishes Wilhelm Meister's Wanderjahre oder die Entsagenden, William Master's Journeyman Years or the Renunciants. The 1821 version of the Journeyman Years ends with Book 3, Chapter 9, this is the book in which, as we read on page 363, Leonardo is addressing the groups of emigrants or colonizers, if you will, 
um, we read at the beginning of that chapter, the day of great moment had dawned. Today the first steps were to be taken toward the general emigration. Today would decide who would actually go out into the world and who would prefer to stay on the contiguous soil of the old world and seek his fortune. Leonardo addresses the group and the chapter and the book in 1821 ends with a poem which I will read. Cling not to your homeland's charms. Take fresh courage, freely roam, strong and daring, heads and arms, everywhere can be at home. Where we gladly greet the sun, every care is gone at last, each a different course may run, therefore is the world so vast. So this book ends with the statement that the reason why the world is so big is so that we can spread out into it. This statement of European colonialism is really worth looking at and worth examining. And I hope to be able to come back to that later on. But let me just point out now that this statement of colonization should be read alongside the closing few scenes of Faust, um, where Faust has a utopian project of colonizing a certain portion of Earth and Goethe shows us how colonialism involves violence and murder and appropriation of land that doesn't belong to Faust. So when we consider the colonialism theme in Wilhelm Meister, I'd like us to remember that Goethe has very mixed feelings about what colonialism is and what it can achieve. Four years after the publication of the first version of The Journeyman Years, Goethe gets to work again on revising it and on adding to it. And in the first half of 1826, he's writing intensely. Um, and he's finished, and the second version of The Journeyman Years appears in February 1829. So that's all for today. Next week I'd like to talk about the structure of the book, but I'd also like to talk about the politics of bodies. Taking up on this colonialism theme, taking up on Goethe's views of modernization and modernity, and his critique of it. Until then, goodbye.